I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. When is civility a duty, and when is it a trap? This was the thought-provoking and insightful question delivered in the New York Times Magazine last year. Its author is novelist ZZ Packer, the author of a story collection, Drinking Coffee Elsewhere, fellow at the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research, and editor of New Short Stories from the South. Born in Chicago and raised in Atlanta and Louisville, Packer has taught creative writing at the University of Iowa Writers Workshop, Tulane, Stanford, and Johns Hopkins. The reality is that our incivility often reveals much more profound ruptures and that the obvious kind of civility, the civility of niceness, is only the most superficial marker of much deeper moral obligations, Packer wrote. This indeed demands us to differentiate between the civility of manners and that of morals. After all, she so compellingly writes, deep down, we probably all know it's not just civility we're missing, but decency. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me here, Alexander. Civility, how do you define it? I would say that that's part of the problem, that in trying to define civility, every person has their own internal definition. And so some people believe that civility is how we treat other people. Um, for instance, when uh, Press Secretary, uh, White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders was at a restaurant, she thought of civility as people allowing her to be at the restaurant and to go unmolested, the same with um, um, Kirsten uh, Nielsen, the former um, Homeland Security Secretary. And others feel as though civility is something deeper than allowing the surface calm um, of our daily interactions to um, continue sort of unmolested. And they believe that civility is actually more closely related to civic duty. But I feel as though the latter portion of people are kind of few and far between, that we typically think of civility colloquially as that mannered, polite way in which we interact with others, even if we disagree with their positions. Um, it's linked to tolerance, you know, and more closely to toleration, which has to do with um, when we dislike someone's opinions, but we still manage to put up with them. Put up with them. <laughs> so people have the working definition of civility as the polite type. Right. But I believe that its undergirding, its foundation is actually a sort of civic duty that gives, of, of which the polite type is the veneer. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And thank you for writing this piece. Oh, um, because people don't think of civility through that lens. And you are also sympathetic in this piece and in your writing to the idea that there are such things as decorum and mm -hmm. manners mm -hmm. and that politeness. The way I frame it here on this program is to talk to someone each week, you have to maintain some of those decorum and yes. manners and diplomacy, is civil society. Why can't we understand civility through the lens of that is how we achieve and preserve civil society? I feel as though right now what's happening is if you have a kind of rupture, you know. Um, it's one thing to just have a civil society and be civil to one another when, yes, you disagree about some kinds of minor issues, you know. Um, in the past, Republicans and Democrats, or the right and the left, had a similar pathway that they wanted. They wanted America to be um, good, to, for it to be powerful, by and large, for it to, to succeed, um, but they had different ways of getting there. Um, and I feel as though now we feel as though we have different, not just different ways of getting there, but even different goals, you know, goal posts. So, so I believe that that is one reason why it's become more difficult for people to interact or see that they share any kind of civic, um, uh, there's any kind of continuity with the sort of civility that they share. But I feel as though that then, um, that if they don't even try at the veneer, 
you know, of it, the being polite, that it's at some level we then can't sort of get to the deeper one anyway. So it's not even just sort of like, okay, only look, exercise one, the polite version of physical disability, or only exercise a sort of deeper one, but we have to kind of be doing both at the same time. And if we don't, we can't ever kind of get to this middle. It's like a chicken and egg. You, I do feel right? as though it's like a chicken and egg uh, conundrum. Like, well, what do you do first? You know, and who is going to be the one to, um, be the first to do it because that then positions that group as potentially being on the losing end. To me, what civil society or civility encompasses are rights, yes. civil rights, yes. civil disobedience, and ultimately civil dialogue. Yes, um, and I, I think that one of the problems that when, when we can't even sort of acknowledge, well, well, here are rights. And this is where I, I, I wish in the article I could, um, I allude to in talking to, uh, uh, talking about John, uh, John Rawls, who's an American philosopher, who takes a sort of Kantian position or kind of a, a take on, on Kant, um, the sort of moral obligations that we have in terms of those rights, our duties, um, uh, responsibilities. But... Other writers also talk about this as well. I think um, one is Amy Gutman and, and um, Dennis, uh, uh, maybe it's Thompson, and, and de Why Deliberative Democracy and um, Democracy and Disagreement, and then some other people like Sharon um, Krauss and Civil Passions. And what they talk about is this, or at least I'll start with Amy Gutman and Deliberative Democracy and Democracy and Disagreements, is that if you, if you have certain, not just certain rights, if you begin from a sort of structure in terms of thinking that the other side has to make, your side and the other side, has to be responsible for making a rational argument for why you are imposing your will upon this other side in a way that they don't want, you know, then why are you doing that? As long as you can give certain kinds of reasons. And she began with, um, when writing this book, or at least democracy and disagreements, with the idea of you know, George W. Bush taking the nation to war. Well if the rest of the country isn't entering into this conversation, then how can this be a valid position? It's not saying that war itself is bad and she's not getting into any of that, but just how can, if you can't have a rational argument, you can't bring this argument rationally so that if it was flipped in the other direction, on the other side, you would say the same thing and agree and allow them to have um, uh, whatever kind of position that you want or idiosyncratic position that you would want. As long as you have that structure, then at least we can have some sort of discourse. But without the structure that enables those sort of reason giving um, rationales um, and consent, you know, then we can't begin to have any kind of civil dis discourse because everyone can always say, or the other side can always say, well, this is what I want and so Mike makes right and I'm gonna get it. Um, so part of the problem is actually having the space in which those rights that you talk about and those responsibilities and reason, reasons are, are centered in a way in which we can all agree on what those are. But we've gotten to the point where I, I feel as though we, we don't do that anymore. And because we look around us. At least with this last us, president, this right, current president. Right, the current president. When we look at the current president and we look around us and we see a universe of fiction. Yes. Are we desensitized to the point or? Exactly, your, your point is that here we've gotten into a world in which it's more like a reality television show, right. you know? And it be has become a way in which, yes, this is a, there are real events that are occurring, but they're occurring in a way in which they're not, the, the, the facticity of those events is not being honored or acknowledged. Right. You know, so when you have this world in which, you know, the next, the next day we've, we've forgotten what has happened in the, the previous day, Marita Butina, or, you know, you'd have someone who is um, indicted or someone who has been prosecuted, and then we move on to the next thing. Well, in that kind of world, I, there's the ground or the foundations upon which civility needs to rest, which is a, a certain type of stability, which Hobbes talks about. Um, he's not necessarily people's favorite philosopher, um, and he's considered maybe a little outdated and antiquated, but the idea... That, very relevant. But very yeah. relevant is that right now, um, with something like Leviathan, was just to say that if you don't have any kind of institutions or norms, for him it was a parliament or a sort of sovereign in which you could have some sort of power, and we all agree that when this power says X, then that that is not ar arbitrary. But when you have someone like the current president, D Donald J. Trump, in which 
power is used in an arbitrary way, and facts and events that have occurred just a day ago are forgotten and replaced with new ones without any kind of grounding in those previous facts, then we have, we have become desensitized, and it becomes a way in which the very network and the roots of civility are, are um, torn asunder. Are you afraid of the power of, of fiction is slipping away because our real life has, has become something, like you say, of a reality TV show? I do sometimes think about that because I, as a, as a you know, novelist and a writer of short stories and, and a writer of fiction and a reader of fiction, I, I, I know that I myself read less fiction now and I'm a writer than I um, did under other administrations it's simply because a lot of my reading time is taken up by you know, reading what's going on in the world today and then actually reading um, analogs or trying to find analogs to that in the past. And so then I'm reading a lot more political philosophy, nonfiction, I'm not a political philosopher, but nonfiction um, that deals with um, political science, but also just current events, and then also uh, the presidency, and also things like fascism and revanchism, and, and all these different topics, just to try to understand what's occurring. Um, and some people will, will say that they read more fiction because of escapism, but in terms of fiction being a way in which we find enlightenment, you know, and a way to overcome and transcend some of the things that are occurring. I mean, you know, you take someone like Orwell. Orwell is fiction, and yet. Orwell provides an, an, an incredible metaphor for understanding totalitarianism in a way that we might not get if someone just wrote, you know, totalitar about totalitarianism. Now, there's Hannah Arendt, who, of course, writes very, um, uh, 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 the origins of totalitarianism is an amazing book. But we refer to Orwell as a sort of, the, with metaphors in terms of 1984 or something being Orwellian or newspeak or doublespeak. Um, so we are possibly missing out on some of the ways in which fiction can be above the fray and actually educate us um, about Morally transformative. It, I don't know if we're desensitized to a point or if it's just the same old news that uh, To Kill a Mockingbird or mm -hmm. Inherit the Wind or when you think of defining movies that had the effect even incrementally of uh, activating our consciousness, it's yes. not clear that there's that one coming that up. There can't, right? <laughs> that there have been <laughs> any in the last however many decades. Well, I think one thing that happens is that it's sometimes hard to, to see at the moment, you know, what piece of fiction comes forward to be a kind of, uh, I won't say harbinger because that means a sort of a warning or a sort of bellwether of, of what um, is to come, but, but, but kind of, um, uh, a, a, you know, symbolic of that age. So sometimes it's hard to find during the age that you're living in, what is symbolic of it? Sometimes right. that comes, you know, sometimes that comes later. But I will tell you that I, I am worried for the state of, I mean, all nonfiction seems to be about Trump, you know, um, and all um, uh, fiction uh, seems to sort of, in some ways, want to address some of the um, issues, you know. Like a lot of fiction is just jumps coming to terms with 9-11, us being in these sort of the wars in Iraq and in Af Afghanistan. Some of the fiction is just coming to terms with that. Um, and some of the fiction is actually probably describing this moment, even though we don't know at the moment that it's doing so. I think that bigotry is the central obstacle to realizing both kinds of civility, the civility of manners and the civility of morals. I, I would say yes, because one of the things that bigotry um, enacts in the human brain is it, well rather, I'll go back a little bit, it actually shuts off, you know, the potential for interaction um, with other people because it only says that people are a type, you know, um, and not an archetype, but a stereotype. And so in doing, in civility, one has to actually, one of the, one of the sort of tenets of it is, is addressing your interlocutor, your, your, you know, the person on the other side or whoever is asking questions or whoever is potentially your opponent but not necessarily your enemy um, as a human, you know. And one of the, um, one of the, Cheshire Calhoun, who is a, um, I guess, I think she would describe herself maybe as a feminist theorist but also a political scientist, a philosopher. Um, one of the things she, she says, and I, I, I quote her in here, is that 
civility, even if it's not considered necessarily a vir virtue, like it's not, a lot of political philosophers, philosophers don't consider it necessarily a virtue, that what it is is a kind of moral language. And that moral language presumes that the other human, the person across from you is human and wor is worthy of being treated with respect and talked to with respect. And so bigotry erases that you know, moral sense of that person who is across from you having worth and dignity that you have or that you would give to someone else of your in-group. So I would agree that, you know, when we saw the um, uh, protests in Charlottesville, which, you know, the riots, the right, you know, the Unite the Right uh, protest, that was bigotry basically saying, we don't care, you know, about your feelings. Um, they sometimes swath it in kind of this idea of PC, so that's become taken up as something that's uh, antithetical to actually real thinking, um, which I don't believe is the case. And I actually don't believe that some people will argue that uh, PC language actually is the opposite in some cases of free speech or civility or whatever. But I would say no. I would say bigotry actually shuts all of that transmission you know, and cuts it off, and it shuts down any kind of conversation. I would also say, on the um, on the deeper sense, the di deeper sense of civility, one of the things that bigotry does is it removes the bigot from the moral responsibility of participating in a civic society with others that are not like him or herself. So yes, I would be in complete agreement with that. And a lot of people would say that, that and this is a way in which civility is tied to tolerance. Um, and toleration is that if you don't have a society that's, um, it, it, you know, we think, tend to think of it as a democratic society that is promoting uh, tolerance or has as its sort of bedrock value tolerance, then um, civility is, can't then issue forth because if you don't have it, tolerance as one of your main tenets and, and ways in which you treat others, then civility is impossible. And I would actually say that with no matter how you think about the current president, Donald Trump, to not be able to tolerate the humanity of, of migrants, you know, and allow them to the border, whether or not you think they should be here or not or whatever, if you're a Republican or a Democrat, that inability to tolerate um, uh, the humanity of those people or to tear gas them or have tear gas children and, you know, and women and the weak and people who are fleeing gang violence and domestic violence, means that, um, that we've lost a kind of bedrock that you know, civility is built upon. So I feel as though we're in dire straits right now, and not just because of the political, you know, musical chairs that's happening you know, right now, but because of just losing these basic values that are actually related to uh, what a, a, a lot of Western liberal democracies hold dear. A mindset and a worldview. Yes. And how you explain to people this question of why civility is important. Well, you know, you talk about the Oxford English Dictionary definition, yeah. but I think that it's that one needs updating uh, to consider civilization, you know, if you think it right. Yeah. Because, and then that gets back to the tolerance and toleration and ownership of a society. And if you're going to exclude folks, um, on what basis you're doing that. You're precisely right, and I'm going to just say that this is one of the, I love the New York Times Magazine, and the editors there are, are great, Nissa Abebe and um, Jessica Lustig and, and, um, and Jake Silverstein, they're, they're wonderful. But one of the, the, the you know, just the limits of, of having a, a newspaper, a, you know, a newspaper essay, um, even etym an etymological essay of this type, is that you can't go into all of the definitions. So actually, in one of my first drafts, you know, I did precisely have civilization in there because, you know, civility is related to civilization and it also re was related to the idea of citizen, you know, who's considered a citizen and that came from the French, I'm going to say this incorrectly, but the French citoy citoyenne, you know, and that was, um, that all co sort of contributed to the various iterations of civ civility. Um, but in terms of civ civilization, um, which also, this also did not make it in there, but there's a, 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 socio, a sociologist, um, very seminal, called Norbert Elias, and he's not in that, but he, his book is called The Civilizing Process. And one of, the, one of the ways in which he talks about 
how, at least in um, Western Europe, people began to, to sort of uh, go from just you know, complete violence, you know, or having sort of a fairly sort of violent affairs to, to basically having societies that grew more and more peaceful were these sort of ever constraining or ever widening rings of sort of shame, but also um, rituals, but also sort of um, uh, reliance upon other people. So in a way, he talks about, you know, this being a process. And, and, and in the end, I think this was in 1939 or something that it was published. But then, you, you, you know, you have obviously just prior to that First World War, you have the Second World War, and you have um, the Holocaust. And so, the, well, what does it mean to have, um, to call this civilization and when, when you can have the Holocaust happen, or you can have slavery right. occur? When so you're th uncivilizing after you claim to have civilized. Exactly. But then this is the trillion dollar question. How do you make people more decent mm -hmm. Uh, we don't like to say, you know, how do we civilize it? There is a certain connotation. One of the ways that we can become more um, civil towards each other actually has to do with what you mentioned earlier, um, just at the top of the show, which we mentioned civil disobedience. And um, one of the things that that does is it kind of operates as a check. You know, even though a lot of, at the time, you know, King, when he was exercising civil disobedience, or um, Gandhi, um, or you know the, the idea of uh, of, of, of uh, Emerson Thoreau, like any type of civil disobedience is basically a way of saying I am taking this my civic duty seriously, and so should you. And when there's something wrong and we are not um, being treated correctly, or someone is being um, treated with intolerance, or someone is being you know in the case of like Black Lives Matter and that movement. You're having people who are just being, who are being killed simply because of being black. Um, then protest and civil disobedience forms this check in a way so that we are reminded of our duties, you know, our civil duties and the rights that the civil rights that others um, have, you know, which grow, which some would argue are outgrow an outgrowth of our um, natural, you know, natural rights. Um, so I think that's one way. Um, and related to outrage, outrage also has these two capacities in which it can operate. One is just sort of the outrage cycle of so-and-so does something, a starlet does this, and then there's outrage over, you know, Pete Davidson and Ariana Grande or whatever, you know, whatever the latest thing is. Or Trump does something that's really silly or whatever, and there's outrage over that. But then there's a sort of deeper outrage that's, once again, a moral outrage. There's a parallel track here, right? Exactly. And it's our response. And so it's something that I think I'm, I may be misquoting Sharon Cross, but in Civil Passions, she talks a lot about the affective response. And so whereas, you know, Gutman and Thompson and deliberative democracy and um, or why deliberative democracy and um, democracy and disagreements seem to talk about um, the rash, rational arguments that we um, make and give each other to have this uh, discourse of we, how we make decisions. One of the things she tends to talk about is that, well, you do need a certain amount of sentiment and a certain amount of, um, of sort of moral feeling in order to operate. And so our decisions, this idea that you could have decisions just be um, uh, divorced from that kind of sentiment and this idea of sort of pure rationality actually doesn't necessarily lead you to decisions that are um, morally right. morally just. In, a, in an outrage that is fleeting and inconsequential versus an outrage that is enduring and exactly. that's meaningful. When does civil disobedience, as someone who really does respect that and considers that to be part of civility, become indecent? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I think that at the, at the time of a lot of movements, a lot, the majority of people, um, a lot of time, at the time of a lot of protest movements, the majority of people tend to think that that becomes indecent. You know, that that's indecent because the norms are that you don't march in the, you know, march in the street. And sometimes even peaceful disobe uh, civil disobedience can be thought of as being awful. But I would say that if we kind of followed in the wake of someone like, um, well, you know, there's two ways to look at it. Someone like King, you know, someone like Gandhi, Passive uh, nonviolence was not necessarily um, all that passive, you know. It's sort of like enacting a nonviolent way in which you were just, 
and yet you were still protesting. And it might have been considered um, some actions would be illegal if they say we're blocking off the street and you go past it anyway. But you're still not being um, violent. I would say, and others would say that revolutions, you know, and rebellions, which can be violent, um, once they win, seem justified. I don't know if I would go that far. I don't know if I would say that um, it's you're justified in killing someone else or hurting someone else to prove your point, you know. Um, so I would say that if you're doing what you can, it may be illegal, but it might be right. Um, but if you're following a, a moral law and, a, and a, um, the law where you're not taking away anyone else's um, their life, their liberty, their um, their rights, then your decision to protest and enact civil disobedience is a good one and a just one, and and not just good and just and and necessary, but but a moral obligation. Zizi, thank you so much. For your thank time you, today. Alexander. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.